this is the flow of my career. And I show it to students because you don't have to know right now where you're going. I didn't. I started out in, this is R&D, this is technology. Then when I got my MBA, I moved over to Booz Allen, which is like McKinsey, and then stayed in consulting, went to California to run SRI, Stanford Research Institute Consulting, and then went back into industry with my own companies. So, you know, opportunities come up, and I'm sure you'll have many yourself. Um, my last startup, Eoplex, was a 3D printing where we printed metal and ceramic together and we made a thousand parts like a cookie sheet at once and it was for uh, semiconductor mounting and, and uh, it avoided all the nasty chemicals so we got away from the etching and the plating high IO funded it by VC funding California is big on venture capital and uh, those are the VCs that funded it and then it was acquired by ASTI in Singapore they wanted me to move to Singapore I wasn't going to move to Singapore so they took the company and moved it, and we stayed. At that point, I didn't know exactly what to do, so I started teaching and mentoring. Um, these are all the places uh, on the left. I teach now at Stanford, at Notre Dame, Menlo, here at UFM, and Hayek. Hayek was a project we launched at the Antigua Forum. It's in Brazil. And in 2020, we launched, uh, we helped the young man who was starting the college launch his college. I gave their inaugural lecture last Saturday. Then on the right side, uh, mentoring. So the uh, Stardex, Antigua Forum, Draper, and the Miller Center. I uh, was, you heard I was president of the Antigua Forum in 2016. I had the honor and privilege to, but I, unfortunately I was the last person to get to work as president with Giancarlo. Uh, and he passed away in 2016. Great loss. Um, so, the Silicon Revolution. Now, you don't have to be a techie. I know many of you are, but you don't have to be for this course. Uh, I will explain everything. And if you have questions, just you know, raise your hand. I'm, I'm from California. I don't, I don't even need to wear a sport, sport jacket. So, uh, we're going to look at why, where, how it's made such a big impact on society, why they're everywhere, right? Um, this workshop is actually based on a, a, a course I teach at Stanford and at Notre Dame. It's also um, the lecture I gave here on a similar topic in 2020 was uh, the inspiration for me to develop a new course. So I did a lecture here at UFM and I started looking at it and said, I can create this into a, a short course, six, uh, a six week course. Is Monica still here? No. We could do the whole six weeks course here if we wanted to. By the way, you should get credit for coming here today. I hope you do. I mean, yeah, you know, this is uh, like a, a separate thing. So anyway, um, one of the books, oh, I use it very, I, I recommend uh, Johnson's book on how we got to now. It's eight technologies, explains how that impacted today's uh, life and how it impacted society. It's a, it's a good book. The Innovators, I also recommend, but it's a big, thick book, so I didn't want to bring it because I had too many things to carry. Okay, so I recommend that. Um, so, back to our topic. There are thousands of times more transistors produced every year than all the grains of wheat and all the grains of rice in the world. They're everywhere. In fact, it's been estimated that there are more transistors in the world than all the grains of sand on the earth. So the question I have for you is, they're everywhere, they have a huge impact on the world, more than you may know right now, but you will know at the end of this, but have you seen one? And do you own any? Who has seen a transistor? Okay, one, two, three. Oh, many of you have seen transistors, great. Who owns some? Do any of you own any? How many do you own? Millions? Do I hear billions? Probably in this room right now, if we added it up, there'd be half a trillion transistors. You all own some. Who has a modern iPhone? What one do you have? 11. That's about 6 billion in your pocket right now. Right? Has anybody got a 14? Okay. Well, why do you have a 14? 
<laughs> okay, well, uh, that's a good reason to buy an expensive phone. You've got, um, the 14's got uh, uh, 16 billion transistors. They're so small you can't see them. So how did this all happen? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. All right, um, what are they? Why are they so important? Where are they? Why are they everywhere? And a little, so the beginning of this talk is a history. So we're going to combine some history, some, uh, some uh, economics, and then some technology. And so um, what's Moore's Law? How do they work? It's, it's easy to understand how transistors work. What's their impact? The future? Questions welcome anytime. And I've saved time at the end. In fact, I don't have any, we're done. Uh, Susan and I, my, my wife Susan, uh, are going back to um, California tomorrow. So I have nothing in the afternoon. If anybody wants to talk about anything, entrepreneurship, venture capital, this stuff, I'm available. Okay? And before I go any, any uh, further, I really need to thank Natalia. Uh, she has been terrific in setting this up and keeping me informed, keeping me up to date. And where's Paulina? Did she leave? Oh, and she's been wonderful. She's just uh, it's like a, a sh ray of sunshine when I see her. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with uh, fire a million years ago. Let's start with light, I should say, a million years ago. So what we had daylight and we had moonlight and we had starlight. What was the only source of artificial light? The first source of artificial light. Anybody got an idea? Fire? Any other ideas? Okay, fire. Let's see. So I mentioned Johnson. He has a chapter on light. You say, who said fire? Okay, let's see if, if he agrees with you. Um, <laughs> he has a funny way of putting it, doesn't he? But yes, fire was the first source of, of artificial light. Uh, for a long time, we had to burn something to get light. Um, about a million years ago, early hominins learned how, learned how to use fire but it was all natural sources. So what, what would be the most likely natural source for fire? Fuel. That's a fuel, what would be the source? How do you get it started? If you're looking, you can't make it yet, you didn't learn how to make it, but your natural source for fire. Anybody? How would you, what, what do you think they discovered to get something that could, they could start a fire with? Huh? If they could reach the sun, that would work. Or if they had a magnifying glass, that could work. Or a big lens, uh, but they didn't. What, what, what could they have discovered or stumbled upon in the woods? Okay, that's later. What, what natural source was lightning. And, uh, and we, if we're in California, we have forest fires all the time. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, lightning would be one of the f uh, sources of artificial fire. In Guatemala, you have another source. <laughs> yes, of course. You're lucky. You've got one more source. You can go up to the volcano and get us. Now, there was somebody who had to keep the fire going in the, in the camp, somebody in the tribe, or maybe a team. Imagine if you let it go out. It not, wouldn't be easy. To, you've got to wait for a lightning storm. Here, you'd go back up to one of your volcanoes and and get fire again. But what if you were in some other country that didn't have volcanoes? You had to wait for a lightning storm or you had to find another tribe to trade something to get light. If you, if you were the team that let fire go out, you probably were in trouble. I guess they want me to use this. All right, so um, friction. W then we learned about 200,000 years ago, people learned how to make it, not just find it. And friction and sparks were the first um, sources. Has anybody gone on a, uh, what would you call it, survival class where you, where you made fire? You, you did? Oh, no, you're just passing it there. Uh, did anybody go to one of the course where you made fire in the woods? No? No? So the two sources are obviously um, sparks, right? 
and then friction. If you've ever tried to make fire with sparks, it's hard. It really, I mean, you can't get something. It's real, you gotta be real lucky to get something to burn. So what do we use? We use lighter fluid. <laughs> but so they use they use sparks and then friction. And I used to do a, uh, the friction thing, but it makes a, it takes a long time and it makes a lot of smoke. And Kaya was not happy with it. So we're not going to make fire today. I didn't really, but we could go outside and make fire. But the bow is easier because of friction. And and that you recognize the movie? No, it's a good movie with Tom Hanks. Uh, Castaway. Castaway. Okay. So for most of human existence, we had to burn something. Somebody had to keep getting fuel. We had to burn something to get light. Um, sperm whale oil was a really popular fuel. It was uh, smoke-free, nice white light, right? Um, low odor. It was really popular. It was so popular, uh, but it was not very abundant because the sperm well, oil does not come from the blubber. There are tons of blubber, thousands of pounds of blubber on a whale, but the sperm oil comes from its head. And it's only about 500 gallons per whale. And that's too bad for the sperm whale because it meant we were hunting them to extinction. You see that chart, right? That's the US alone, 10,000 whales a year. So at that rate, and the, look, at the, look at the trajectory, the chart is, you know, uh, you know, it's moving up and up and up and up, right? Now, what could have caused that downturn? Why did we get a peak in around 1850, 1860, and all of a sudden the demand went down for sperm whale oil? What, what do you think drove it? Why did we stop using it? No, it was good quality. It was one of the advantages. That's why everybody wanted it. But what? Found another light source. OK. What do you think it was? Light bulb? Too soon. We didn't get light bulbs. Oil. Oil. That's right. OK. So it's not a government regulation that said, stop hunting the whales. It's good old capitalism, <laughs> right? What innovation saved the whales? Kerosene, you're absolutely right. Now, learning how to distill kerosene from fossil fuel, from oil. I love this because in California, I just love to tweak the students because this is oil saved the whales. I mean, the bumper sticker in California is um, save the whales, save the whales. Oil saved the whales. And it was learning how to make kerosene. It was still a problem, right? We've got kerosene now, but fire is still a problem. What's wrong with fire for light? Where's my friend back there with the iPhone 14? Como se llama? Jackie. Jackie, what's, problem, what's one problem with fire for light? It's dangerous. OK, what else? Okay, right. You had, uh, it wasn't really good light. I mean, if in the movies, they go into a cave and they, they light a torch and all of a sudden all the lights come on. But no, if you've ever been in a cave with a torch, it's, it's dark. Um, but you had smoke. Somebody had to keep getting fuel. You had to get more kerosene. You had to get, you know, more, more wood, whatever it was, right? And you had big things like this is the 1871 Ch Chicago fire supposedly started when Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lamp, an oil lamp in the barn and started the fire. Thousands of homes were burned. Square miles were destroyed. And some people were killed. Probably happened in every country, right? So uh, what replaced fire for light? Now you can, <laughs> now you've got it. Who was the, uh, what replaced fire of any type for light, for, as a, a new light source. What was the new light source? Light bulbs. Light bulbs. Right, 1880s, great innovation. This changed history. 
It's changed. Uh, I mean, you walk into a room now, you, you almost assume there's going to be a switch about this high, right? No matter where you are in the world. And it, it changed all sorts of things. Um, so the light bulb. This is a replica at the Edison Museum. In, uh, GE owns it. And that's the way that it looks. And anybody have any idea who this is? This person with the light bulb? Is that Edison? Any idea? No? Where's Jackie? Who's, who, who is that? It's me. I've aged a bit. Um, I'm a little older. This is when I was your age. I won an award and they took me to, to the museum, took my picture with the, the, the light bulb. Couldn't recognize me, huh? All right. Okay. So early applications of electricity used electricity kind of not at the individual electron level, but like a fluid, like a flow, right? We did two things. We, we, we did resistance and magnetics. Resistance generates heat. We'll look at that one first. So we knew that if you heated up an electric wire, like in your toaster, you got a little bit of light. But if you wanted to make a light bulb, what would you need? Well, you need it to be much brighter, rugged, practical, low cost, right? You couldn't use this as much of the source for light. So this brings us to Edison. What was required for a successful light bulb? If you were making one, what do you think you needed? What do you need? What are the parts? Hmm, yeah. Well, tungsten is way in the future because it's a m real problem to work with, but a filament. We do need a filament. Today it's tungsten. Oh, by the way, I'm just talking about incandescent lights. I'm not talking about fluorescent and LEDs and all that. So yes, a filament is critical. Edison spent years finding, trying to find a filament, but tungsten is the future. And why do we need, why is tungsten the right answer for the future? Because it, it doesn't melt easily. If you used copper, iron, zinc, any of the common metals, they just melt. So what else do we need? We need power, is that what you said? Transform, you have to, transformer? Yeah, that's what we have right here. Okay, so you need a power source. So, we need a filament that can stand temperature. It's hot. Do you use Celsius here? Yes, yeah, so it's about 2,400 Celsius, right? It's hot. It would melt steel. Um, 4,600 Fahrenheit. I've got to change all this to Celsius. And you need a vacuum. Otherwise, the filament's going to burn up, even tungsten. Um, you certainly need a glass bulb. Imagine if we didn't have glass. It's 1850. What would be used for the light bulb if we didn't have glass? There's nothing. We wouldn't have had them for a long time. There's no cheap common element. Nowadays we have some super plastics that maybe could work, but not, not for 100 years would they have been able to do. So glass was critical. We're going to come back to that. Glass is kind of sneaks in everywhere. Um, power supply, as Jackie said. and. Got to do it at low cost. You know, you can't sell light bulbs for $1,000, right? So he needed to do all this. Now, the filament, they tried thousands of things. Um, a reporter once asked him, how do you feel ha having failed so many times? He said, no, I haven't failed so many times. I've just found thousands of th things that don't work, okay? Oh, in my class, I don't let students use their cell phone or their laptop, unless they're looking up some piece of information about the class. So please put them away. All right. Um, the filament that they found, your name, sir? France. 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 It wasn't, it was a carbon source, carbon light bulb, and it was from bamboo. Uh, but he tried thousands of things. And so we're, light bulbs are critical to our path today, our story today. So I think we should make some. So what do we need? Well, the filament, we're going to use pencil lead. It's carbon. It's mixed in with some plastic to hold it together. And when the plastic gets hot, it's going to smoke and burn. But that's OK. It's the carbon. So that's what we're going to use. We're going to use some way to attach the carbon. And that's these fixtures that I built for you today, all right? Without stressing it, carbon is brittle. 
And so your, your keys is going to be to attach this without putting any bend. Okay? Um, you need a glass bulb, so that's what these are, our light bulbs. Right? We've got to let the light out and keep the filament protected. Uh, we need a transformer, so we're going to use a 12-volt transformer. And we need a vacuum. Unfortunately, we don't have a vacuum pump, so ours are going to burn up without because they're in the presence of air. But it'll, it'll demonstrate what we need. We need one more thing. We need four student volunteers. May I have four student volunteers, please? OK, one, two, three, four, OK. One, two, three, we got five. Now, what I'm, go what I'm going to ask you to do is take a filament, which is a piece of pencil lead, and you're going to attach it to these clips. The trick is, it's very brittle. The trick is you can't put any stress. So what you're going to do is you'll hook it onto one, and it will be up here like this, and you're going to want to bend the filament to bring it down. No. Don't bend the filament to bring it Don't bend the lead to bring it down. Bend this over here. Without putting any stress, bring it down by bending this. And we'll see if, it, if, if you can do that. Often, this is the hardest part. And then when we're done, we're going to time. Somebody out there who's allowed to use their phone for this will we'll time how long they, they burn. We'll see which team. We have two, oh, somebody on this side. Right. We, we'll see which, which team has the uh, best uh, luck. So open these. Don't drop any on the floor, because we have a high standard here at UFM. And somebody come over on this side to help. Because these alligator clips, it's tricky. You're, and if it doesn't work, we'll do it again. We'll, you know. But you want to get one of them and, and put it between these two. And like I said, hook it onto one and then see how you can move these uh, clips. And if anybody wants to come a little closer to see, you're welcome. Um, without stressing the filament. And you need to hook them to, to both sides. Okay, understood? Go for it. And it's easier if, yes, if one person, you can move this. If one person holds the clip, what I usually do is put one on and see where the see where it wants to go. Okay, so that was pretty fast. You didn't bend it. All right. Okay. All right. Who's our timer? Who's got who's got a, an app open that'll time? Anybody? No. Okay, you, you ready? Okay, so which team's first? Oh, you're, you're first. So this, you have to press and hold the button. Okay. Right? Don't just press it. The reason I did that is I used to have a switch and I left it on and I got burned. So w are you ready, sir? Your name? Claudio. Claudio. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, I'm sorry, stop. <laughs> Not fair. Not fair. She gets an extra few seconds. Go. So that's the Edison light bulb. And he was looking to have this last 1,200 hours. And he succeeded. But you have to take all the air out of here because right now that's not burning. It's incandescing. The heat, stop. How much time? 19 seconds. Okay, plus we'll give you five for the... All right, let's see. So, in other words, this isn't burning, although you see some smoke, that's the plastic. It's getting so hot, it's like the sun. It's getting so hot that it gives off light, not burning. But the burning is the plastic in, in the air. Ready? Who's, you ready again? Okay, one, two, three. So that's the smoke, right? So you didn't have the advantage of that. This should go a little longer because it's using up, the smoke is displacing some of the air. That's the Edison light bulb. Before that, we only had fire. After that, we have lights everywhere. Time. Yeah, that's, you got, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, let's have a hand for our, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
What changed with light bulbs? Well, how about safety? You know, imagine walking around London and Jack the Ripper and all that. Uh, you had be able to run three or three shifts a day. You could run. You could keep your factory open at night. If there were people that wanted to work, you could turn the lights on, right? In fact, if you've ever seen those pictures of uh, 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 South Korea and North Korea from space, North Korea is there's nothing at night, and South Korea blazes like you know Las Vegas. It's a measure of economic activity. Uh, you can measure economic activity from space by looking at the light. So it changed a lot of things, plus it created thousands of jobs because, you know, Edison recognized it's not enough to have light bulbs. You know, you, you, I go to a shop and I buy a six pack of light bulbs and I come home and say, hey, Susan, I bought six light bulbs. And she says, what are we going to do with them? There was no fixture. The house isn't even wired for electricity. Why would a house be wired for electricity when there was no, nothing to use it for? So we had no grid, we had no electricity wiring in the house, right? Um, so you had all these jobs, it, it was an economic boom. Fixtures and electricians and safety and the grid, and you had to generate it. Well, I wanna buy electricity, where, where do you go to do that, right? So they had to harness things like waterfalls and learn how to make electricity, companies to sell it. So it was a big, big economic boom, as many innovations are. Lots of times a new innovation creates all sorts of services and safety regulations and all kinds of things, right? So that's light bulbs. Now the other thing, so again, this is using electricity in the kind of gross sense, not very sophisticated, it's just like as a fluid. Now we're gonna look at magnetics. Um, you pass, okay, so let me show you an experiment that changed history. Next time I'm not coming back unless you give me a lapel pin. All right, so piece of steel, bolt, whole bunch of wire, right? Everybody knows what this is. What is this? But if you take a bunch of wire and wrap it around a piece of iron, what do you get? Yeah, an electromagnet, right. So Nobody knew this before, but let's see if I can hold this on with my thumb, my finger, so I can get my assistant here. Now, electricity flows through the coil. What's it do? It creates a magnet. Nobody knew that. Electricity and magnetism are similar. They're kind of the same thing. Now, this was absolutely stunning. Without it, right, electricity does, no magnet. So what did that let us do? Well, all sorts of things. Um, it had a major impact on communication, which was where we're going to go next in this path we've been following, this road of innovation, right? Let's talk about communication. Early communications, signals versus documents. We had, you know, great, was it, uh, was it Game of Thrones where they had the big signal fires or, oh no, it was Lord of the Rings. Right, where the signal fires, or flashes of light with a mirror, or drums, or bells, fast, but limited content. You could not really send very much information this way, but it was, at least it was very fast. The alternative is documents. I write something down, and we put it in a, a train, or we put it on horseback, or we send it in a boat. I can send you a whole book, but it's gonna be slow. So what, what was the innovation that allowed us to send fast and a lot of information? Instantaneous, but a lot of information. Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Telegraph. Telegraph, absolutely. And that's where magnetics comes in. Because what was discovered was that making that magnet if you had a magnet a long, I, I could put the power, the, the power at one end, and I could put this in in uh, Antigua, and we could we could make the magnet make a noise, right? And that got us to telegraph, right? So why is this so important? Well, it was the first time we used electricity to send information, but you could only send pulses. You don't know what I just said, neither do I.
Um, <laughs> and Mr. Morse figured out Morse code. Does anybody know Morse code? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, me too, a little bit. Is anybody an amateur radio operator? No? Okay. Um, so it was a revolution. Now, for us, it looks like, oh, come on, you know, it's not even, I don't have a screen, right? Uh, no modern in invention has influenced society so rapidly, the scientific America. It was absolutely stunning. Billions of messages were sent worldwide, created another whole industry, right? And if you are interested, there's a book called The Victorian Internet, and I get a kick out of the fact that all the things, I often show this to my students, and I ask them, what does it describe, right? Revolutionizing business, new kinds of crime, government tries to regulate it. Looks to me like the web. And that's what, they, that's what happened. It was just an instant, amazing change in the way we, we spoke with you and communicated with each other. Um, what's the universal code for distress, Morse code? Right, right. Do you know it in Morse code? Okay, okay. So the universal code for distress, which you should all know because this has saved somebody's life. I have a flashlight that will automatically send SOS, right? Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Now you say, I don't need that. Of course you don't, but someday somebody might be trapped somewhere. Like those, those uh, young people in, in uh, Thailand, it was kind of in the cave, or you're tapping on a wall. It's it's something that it won't be hard to remember. Everybody here is high IQ. What does it stand for? Any ideas? There's a myth that it stands for save our ship, but it's a myth. It doesn't stand for anything. It's just easy to send quickly. So when I get in trouble, I can. You can do it. Lots of ways you can do it. So now you all know SOS, in case you can't tell. Okay, so why was telegraph so fast? Well, we're talking about electricity, right? We're talking about something that travels at light speed. And light speed is one of those things that really you can't get your head around because we're not really wired for that. But light speed, um, 300,000 kilometers a second, right? So what does that mean? I don't know about you, but I can't really picture that. Well, the fastest human flight, space travel, 25, I'm sorry, this is miles per hour, 25 miles per hour. That's 10, 4,000 of the speed of light. Um, put that in perspective. It took us all day to get here from San Francisco. Long, two flights, long, long, long travel. If we could have traveled at the speed of light, fraction of a fraction of a second would be here. Good brain. If I forgot something, I could draw it in. You wouldn't even see me move. Um, Earth to the sun, eight minutes. Nearest star is Alpha Centauri Group, 4.3 years. 4.3 years. Going 670 miles per hour, it takes, day and night, it takes 4.3 years to get here from that, and that's the closest star. Andromeda galaxy, closest galaxy, two and a half million years. Now I've got a question for you. Suppose we had a prize of a million dollars or more. Could anybody tell me, could you figure out if Andromeda is still there? Why not? How do we, yes. is it, how do we know? We, we look in the telescope, we say Andromeda is it still you there. Know the light, you know the light to the, to the sun to the earth, to the earth takes eight minutes. Do you have something to add? Um, yeah, I think that's why people say when we look at the stars, we look at the past. That's right. So Both of you are absolutely. Stars, we're looking at what it was. That's right. Both of you were right. We're looking at the past. And in fact, the new telescopes looking at the edge of the universe, they're looking at the beginning, 8 billion years. So, you know, how could you tell if Andromeda was. Well, Andromeda could have been eaten by a black hole a million years ago, and we still wouldn't know for another million and a half. So there's no way to know if it's still out there. Beautiful picture, who knows, that's old. You're right, you're looking at, that's the, this image is two and a half million years old by the time it gets here. And, you know, 
if we wanted to go somewhere, you know, you're, a lot of people believe in, you know, the Earth's been visited from people from another galaxy or people from another star. In the current physics, all the experiments for the last 100 years confirm light speed seems to be the li speed limit for the universe. We can't move that fast. If you went by light at the speed of a spaceship, 25,000 miles an hour, so if you went at the speed of a spaceship, 25 miles an hour, it would take you 100,000 years to get there. There, so I don't think too many aliens have come to visit us. But telegraph, we can send signals, speed of light, right, instantaneous. Okay, so as good as it was, it had a lot of disadvantages. You had to write down a message. You had to take it somewhere to be sent. You didn't have it in your house. The operator read your message. Oh, oh, you want to send that, and you want her to what? Oh, okay, so you know, you want him where? So um, that still had a disadvantage, even though it was a revolution. What replaced telegraph? No, no. You all got one in your pocket. Telephone, not cell phone, but telephone. Now I can call you directly. Now it's privacy, unless you know my little sister's at home. Now you can do it in real time. Right? Nobody needs to know what you're saying. Let's Solar energy. Pardon? Solar energy. Solar energy what? To power it? Telegraph to replace telegraph. No, I'm talking. I think you're back at the beginning. So you're back at the beginning of the talk. <laughs> okay, well, we've moved on. Welcome, Kaya. We've moved on now. We're talking about, you know, we have this breakthrough, right? Instantaneous, right? And it's speed of light for the first time ever. What replaces it? Along comes telephone. And we now have privacy, two-way communication. Now we call you instead of the telegraph operator. So now we've, we've moved now in our story using electricity in two ways. One, resistance to create lights. We did good on the light bulbs. And now we're talking about magnetics and um, creating uh, signals for the first time in history, right? 1800s. Okay, so we've got that base. Telephone replaces telegraph, replaced uh, 147 years ago. A telegram, Alexander Graham Bell. This is the first telephone. And as you can see, there's no two pieces, right? It's I talk, then I listen. Then I talk, then I listen. So that was the, that was, now we're, this is our journey. We're doing a little bit of history before we get into super technology, right? How did this all happen? How did it come about? How did it impact us, right? So telephone converts my voice to an analog wave, sends it down a wire, instead of, the, instead of just the Morse code, right? It's now a wave down the wire. And then the receiver replay, uh, reconverts, the, takes the wave, makes it back to sound. I used to have a telegram, telephone demo, but it takes too long to do. But that's basically what a telephone does. Okay, so what's a wave? Well, a wave transfers energy through a medium. But the medium doesn't move. I know breaking, who's the surfer? Anybody a surfer, body surfer? Okay. So, you know, you're riding a wave. It seems like you're going forward. Well, that's a breaking wave. But wave like this, bob, you, you're in a boat, you bob up and down mostly, unless there's a current. The energy goes through. You can, a tsunami can go right through your, your, your boat, but you go up and down, the energy goes forward, right? I found this video that I thought I'd show you. Uh, a wave, right? The medium doesn't travel. The soldiers are the medium. They just go up and down. The energy goes through the wave. Okay, so what waves are measured in three properties. We've got frequency. How many seconds? Frequency. We've got amplitude. How loud is it? Right? How big is it? Ooh, you know, little, big. And then we've got wavelength, the peak to peak distance of the wave. Right? Did anybody, uh, I asked, ham radio operator? Um, nobody was, right. So those three measurements are the measure of wave, okay? And this is a demonstration of hearing. Now, when I first saw this, this was at MIT, I did not believe it. So I'll tell you that after we do the thing. So I want everybody, what, what we're going to do is everybody's going to raise their hand. And I hope the video plays. Um, and, and I want you to listen to the sound. And when you can can no longer hear it, cannot hear it, put your hand down. All right? Understood? 
So everybody raise their hand. As we grow older, we often lose the extreme ends of our hearing spectrum. So how many of the following sounds can you hear? How old are your ears? Okay, if you can hear 8,000 hertz, you're both alive and not hearing impaired. But let's keep raising the frequency. How high could you hear? Wow. If you could hear all of those frequencies, you're probably under 20 years old. But that won't last forever. Unlike other organs such as the liver or skin, the inner ear does not have the capacity to regenerate. In your ear, there are thousands of tiny nerve cells called ear cells. These are responsible for picking up different frequencies and sending the signal to the brain where it's processed. But as you age, the continual exposure to noise and loud sounds can break, bend, and destroy these cells. So why do the high frequencies go first? It turns out that the hairs tuned to high pitches are the first to encounter sound waves. As a result, they experience more stress and tend to degenerate earlier, which is why the older you are, the harder it is to hear high pitches. Okay, so most of you heard, a lot of you heard uh, almost all of those, right? And the first time I heard this, I was, like I said, I was at MIT, and it was a, a presentation, and a group, a, a, an entrepreneurship presentation, and a group of people had a product idea. Back then, shopping malls were very popular in the United States. This is going back sort of 20 years ago. And this idea was, we're going to have annoying music at the right, uh, or sound, at the right frequency that would drive away all of these teenagers that are hanging around outside of our store, and they don't buy anything. But they're making a rowdy in the law, we can't chase them away, And but if we have this high-pitched sound that, that our People with money who are older can't hear at all. We just chase away all the teenagers, and that was a product idea, and it did get funded. I don't think it ever got implemented, but uh, so that's that's a demonstration of frequency. Now, you know, I'm a big fan of science fiction movies, but they're all fake with the sound because there's no sound in space. When they blow up the Death Star, you couldn't hear it. There is no sound. Why? Because there's no medium. You can't sound, you can't hear in the vacuum. Sound requires air, wood, you can put your, you know, you can go out to the railroad and you can put your ear on the, on, the, on, the, on the track, and assuming you don't get your head cut off, you can, you know, the train, you can hear it for miles away, the sound travels very well. Anybody here a scuba diver or a snorkeler? Underwater, the sound travels really well. You can hear all sorts of things. At night, you can hear lobsters every clip that falls. So it needs a medium. Now, that brings us to an entirely different type of wave. A wave that even Einstein wasn't sure what was going on in the beginning. And that's electromagnetic waves, or we call radio waves, but it's all the wireless stuff. And for reasons that are very complicated, not part of this, I told you this is not, you don't have to be a techie for this, this, this uh, workshop. Um, they don't need a medium. They can travel through a vacuum. He asked you, what's, what's waving if there's nothing there? Don't ask me that for today. <laughs> ask me that afterwards because I don't want to lose our audience. Travel at light speed and they don't require a medium. Flat, entirely different uh, science. This was discovered in 1887 by a man named uh, Hertz. And he discovered that an electric spark makes a radio wave, makes a wave that you could detect. If you have something that creates an right? This is creating a radio wave. So um, in my class, I have them take a more powerful one than this apart and build a radio transmitter. Uh, and that's what Marconi did with a spark gap. Now, this is a very messy radio wave. It causes interference everywhere. And you know when you see lightning or you see a spark jump to your finger, you think it jumped to you? It doesn't. It jumps back and forth 300,000 times a second. You can't see it but it's jumping back and forth, back and forth, creating a wave, all right? And it's, it's limited range, you can't tune it, it's messy. And yet, in fact, one we build in class, you take a big stun gun apart, you use the inside, or I use this to wake up students, or students use it. I 
see somebody with their cell phone or their laptop. Um, very handy. But we use it to make a radio transmitter. We hook it up to a keyboard, and we send signals across campus. We could do that here, but it would take more time, different kind of things. Now, as, as messy as this was, the Spark Gap Radio, it was really critical. Um, Marconi, who won the Nobel Prize, wound up sending a signal short distance, longer, 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 across the United States, across the ocean to Europe. The spark he needed was enormous. And the antenna went for like a quarter mile. And in fact, if I put an antenna on this one and that I do in class, I'm breaking the law. But it's okay. It's one of those things that's okay for class demo. You know, you're not really doing it. You're just doing it once or twice. The, the operator had to be in another room and, the, and wearing, you know, ear protection. And the spark was like, they could hear it for miles. But that spark created the first radio wave and, and the first transmission. The only trouble is it's only good for Morse code. Um, when the Titanic, anybody saw the movie, Titanic? Yeah, we just watched it again. Pretty good movie. Uh, when the Titanic sank, 710 people were saved by the fact that they could send a signal wireless. Not this, not sound, but a wireless signal. Basically sending this, like like Morse code, like let's see. Oh, here, let's do, remember, who knows SOS? See that? They didn't know that before. <laughs> I told them they all had to know. Okay, here we go. Now, somebody in the cafeteria or in another building who has a, a radio on, modern radios filter all this out. But, you know, older radio, we just sent them a signal. I said, maybe somebody will come and save us. <laughs> so that was very important, but a very limited technology. Okay? Now, what we needed, and this is, again, we're on our journey here. We're getting the trans transistors. They needed something that could replace the crude spark. We need to generate a pure signal, not a messy signal. Something you can tune, right? Something you can get circuit and amplify from. What was that? What we what what was that? Anybody have an idea? Guess what this invention was that took away uh, that replaced spark gaps? And, yeah. The super heterodyne circuit. That's the circuit. What's the thing that drives it? You're on the right track. What's the key element in that circuit? A what? You plug it in. It lights up. It glows red. It breaks if you drop it on the floor. A light bulb is where it came from. But what is it? Back then, I'm sorry, you didn't get the CM? Crown. Is this what you're looking for? Who knows what this is besides Who? <laughs> okay. Brilliant. All right, so anybody else? Who, who else has either seen, heard, studied? Just one of you in the whole, okay? This started the entire electronic revolution, right? You never saw it. And yet it was, for 50 years, the only technology. So you can pass these around. <laughs> So this allowed, this is a vacuum tube, it's all kinds. Here's one that's made in, in, in metal. Here's a miniature one. Hold on, they're just so big. Um, so now you've all not just seen a vacuum tube, you've handled a vacuum tube. And this was the beginning of everything. TV, radio, altimeters. Oh, so you're, most of you've got the miniature ones. They came, come even bigger, but I have to decide how much to pack. You know, I get up to like 30 pounds. I'm going to UFM, I'm going through customs. So they get bigger than this, too. A key technology that's not in your memory, not in your history course. I teach a course in history of technology. This is absolutely key. For 50 years, the only technology, all television, all stereo, all amplifiers, everything. Yeah. But what in the world is this? How did we forget something? Oh, by the way, these used to burn out. They're a little bit, you know, we talk about light bulbs. They, they, this used to burn out. Oh, wait, I'll, I'll come back to that. I made a little business out of this when I was in high school. Um, so, we got the light bulb, right? We made UFM light bulbs. If we could get a vacuum pump here, we, they'd last longer. What was the, how long did they last? 26, 26 seconds was the maximum. And that's because, of course, we don't have, we got a lot of air in here. 
We made Edison light bulbs. This is exactly what Edison did, except he got his to last 1,200 hours. They're nice and bright. Try to see them before. With the light bulb, you natural, we're all curious, right? This is, this is, this is UFM, right? It's capitalism. It's, it's free enterprise. It's freedom. So somebody came along and said, what would happen if I stuck another wire into this light bulb? What would, what would happen? Well, they, were, they could do that. They had glass blowers, and they could put a wire in. Well, they had the filament, which, which we had, and they put in another wire. Called the, now it's called, today it's called the anode. They just stuck a wire in and melted the glass and put it in. What did they discover? Oh, my goodness. The electricity will flow across that space. Now we're into electrons. We're no longer using electricity as a flowing fluid. Now it flows across that vacuum from the cathode to the anode, major discovery. So, so what? Well, somebody else comes along and says, what if I put another, I'll, I'll melt a little thing, stick another element in here between. That's called the grid. Holy cow. Is that to say holy cow? I don't know. Uh, you add a third element, it's called a grid, and it can control the flow, just like a valve. In fact, the Brits, anybody here from England? The, the, anybody been there? The, I used to work for uh, the Brits call vacuum tube valve. That third element, that grid, uh, that third element can control the flow precisely. Not like a valve that you turn, you get water, but precisely control the flow. Right? That's a big deal because now, this is our vacuum tube that I passed around. Now, Lee DeForest perfects it, and it's called the triode. And for the first time, we can do three key things. We can create pure, you wanted a heter, super heterodyne circuit. We can create pure sine waves, not messy, you know, not this. But now we can do a pure sine wave. We can amplify weak signals and get circuits. And we can do switching for computers. Now, that's coming long. We're, we're at the early stages now. You know, we're back with uh, stuff that looks like this. We're not at computers yet. So three things. Let's take a look at that. Radio. Instead of this messy wave, which is all over the spectrum, we now have a pure wave. Huh? You coming to see me? OK, I told him I wouldn't come back unless I had a lapel mic. What do you mean it's only for the recording? Can't they hear it? Yeah. Well, then I don't want it. Yeah. It doesn't amplify through the speakers? Yeah. They can't hear me? No. All right, thank you. I, I tell people, I'm amazed at this place, UFM. Everything is so clean, everything works, everything is up to date. I never even, I've never even seen this before. I know a laser pointer doesn't work on a screen. A lot of the universities where I teach, I can't. Use, I have to have a stick, and I never even saw that. But uh, you know, got to do something. Got to do something about that. Okay, just for the recording. So now we got a pure wave that can go a long distance. We can tune it. You know, FM ninety-eight point three, right? Very exact tuning. But what do we do with that pure wave? All it is is, if you could hear it, you know, per, I, I don't have good pitch. Susan could sing it, but very. Uh, so what do we do with that? Well, what we do with that is we modulate. AM, amplitude modulation, FM, frequency modulation. Not going to go into that. Don't worry. This is not a tech course. But what we do is we use the audio or video or any other source to shape the carrier. Now we're sending out not a, just a carrier, but a shaped. Takes a little skill to use this, doesn't it? Takes a shaped carrier. Then, at the receiver, we can, we can re subtract the carrier and get the audio or video back. That's all amplification is. Made radio possible, video possible. It's, it's, we're still using it. It's what happens in your cell phone, what happens in any other device. So now we've got a way to send pure radio waves, okay? That spark gap I showed you, around 300,000 cycles per second. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? It's not. Your TV is at... Uh, 30 million cycles, and your cell phone is at a billion cycles per second. Now, these aren't very big waves. A radio wave is about from here to the parking lot. 
from crest to crest. They're huge. You, even when we call shortwave, you've heard the term shortwave radio ham operator, it's about as big as this table, these three tables. You know. So it's not <clears throat> these, but a much, much shorter than this old fashioned spark gap. Okay. This is a thing people don't usually realize. The electromagnetic spectrum. Remember we talked about electromagnetic radio waves. We, we, we kind of talk, we often say radio waves when we mean ele electromagnetic. But it's okay, radio waves. <clears throat> it's a continuum. There is no real difference except frequency between a radio wave and light or x-ray. We use different machines to create these. The sun does it all at once, but we use different machines to create these. But if we had a magic machine where I could just keep turning up the frequency, I'd get to radio, I'd get to the microwave, I'd get to light, I'd get to x-ray, I'd get to gamma wave. They're all the same, except for frequency. We can't do that because we need different machines. But it's a continuum. The other thing is often startling to me is the, is the wavelength. The distance between, we talked about peak to peak on that wave. So you have a sine wave, any peak to peak. Well, look, the radio waves are as big as kind of buildings, right? Or people. And then microwaves about the size of a bug. Visible lights about the size of amoeba. And then you get up into molecules and atoms. And by the time you get the gamma rays, we stop calling them waves. We're now calling them rays atomic nuclei. Now, the, look how small the light part of that spectrum is. That's all we can see. We use the other radio waves, but we can't see them. So that's, that's the light portion. If we look at that, that's the visible spectrum. It's a tiny sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, who can tell me what Roy G. Biv is? Anybody know Roy? Roy, yeah. Speak up. Yes, and how's it work? How does it work? Indigo. Right. So that's the sp yeah. That's right. That's right. Those are the primary colors. But these are all of them. So this is a mnemonic. You, you just like I, you know, now you all know SOS in case you get trapped in the, uh, in, locked in the bathroom or something. Um, and, and now you know Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv is the, is the a mnemonic. It's a memory aid, which I need, for, re, for the spectrum, as, as you said. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay, but look how small it is in the spectrum. But it's the same thing as a radio wave, just different frequency. All right, so remember I told you that microwaves were about the size of a honeybee and visible lights about the size of a protozoa, amoeba or something, bacteria. That's why you can look into your microwave. You have a microwave, you look in, right? You can see it, not terribly clearly because they've got this screen. Microwaves are in there bouncing around the size of honeybee, uh, honeybees. They can't get out. But light, that's trivial for light to move through something like that when the light wave is the size of a bacteria. So that's, that answers the question why you can look into your microwave safely. Okay, so now we get to what we did with these vacuum tubes that you passed around. They can amplify this weak signal from a microphone or anything, comes into that middle plate, that grid, and it modifies the flow of electrons in that arrow exactly like the weak signal, but it uses much more power. So now we have amplification. Three elements, filament, grid, um, anode, one, two, three. And that's three is cri critical because we'll come back and see that again and again. That's how amplification works. Wish I had a pointer. So, so we go, we feed in a weak signal. It f modifies the one in the, the grid in the middle, and that controls a much stronger flow of electricity, but it makes it match exactly. That's amplification. Huge impact. You wouldn't be able to do a political rally or speeches or motion pictures or open air concerts 
You got, now you can have uh, microphone singers. You can have people who wouldn't be able to be heard. Uh, even me, see, I'm using it right now. So all kinds of consequences, right? Uh, Martin Luther King's speech, you couldn't have a million people show up in DC and have, an, and have them hear you unless you had amplification. So amplification had consequences for out throughout society, made radio possible too. Now, Hollywood's idea of amplification is entirely different, right? In, in Hollywood terms, any Lord of the Ring fans here? Wow, I gotta get new movies. You know, you're, uh, you're so young that Lord of the Rings is old stuff. Lord of the Rings is, uh, so, so what's, the, what's the movie that would apply to the, a big scene of a battle? Is there a, con a new one? No? Okay. Well, here's Hollywood. In Hollywood, a guy rides the, the chief. This is Kyle, right? He's on horseback. He's the grand, the, we're all gonna follow him. And there's 10,000 of us in, in, in this army and there's horses making new noise and wearing armor, right? And he rides back and forth and in Hollywood is long, you know, today, today we go after the orcs, today we will die, today for the, the good of the West, it is not the day to be, you know, he's going back and forth, right? And in Hollywood, if you move back and forth, it spreads your voice over 10,000. It's pure BS, right? It's, Very old movie, Lord of the Rings. Like they could really hear it, right? I can tell you, I was there. Um, only the guys in the very front row heard anything. None of us, none of us heard anything beyond that. So that's Hollywood's version of amplification. The other things tubes can do is switch. To do a, to, to, to have an electronic computer, you need instant switching. There were computers before electronics. They were magnetic, they were man me mechanical, they were gears. But to do a big computer, you needed instantaneous switching. Well, if you can make the amplification, you can also do on and off. You feed in from the computer input and you can switch at the speed of light. So that gave us the ability to build computers. This computer is older than me. This is ENIAC, it used 18,000 of the tubes you were passing around, but much bigger than the ones you're, you're seeing here. 18,000 tu tubes. Sounds a lot, right? Yet, it's nothing compared to what's sitting in your pocket right now. Nothing. It's rounding error. It's not even a rounding error. It's nothing. This thing weighed 30 tons and used as much electricity as 10 houses, but it was the first electronic computer, and it could do calculations, 5,000 calculations a second. Sounds fast, right? Keep that m number in mind, We're, we'll get there. Okay, so um, tubes, as I said, made everything possible. Made entire, all electronics were, were tube. I forgot to start timing myself. Okay, I know some of you have to leave early. All right, so all forms of electronics, big, maybe you were in your grandmom's house, you had a a record player or a TV or, or something, and they were big and they were uh, used a lot of electricity, right? But everything was possible now for, for, for because we had tubes. Tubes had problems. What are some, what, just look at them, you, ha you, you pass them around. What, what, what are some of the limitations, some of the downsides of a tube? Yeah, burnout. Burn Come back to that in a second. They use a lot of power. What else? Did anybody drop one? They break. They're pretty, they're pretty tough, but they break. Um, so yeah, they burn out. Lots of power, they're hot, expensive. So what I, I told you about when I was in uh, junior high school, there were TVs with tubes, and there was a man called the TV repairman that would make a, a house call, like a, you know, to fix your TV. And they take the, these are big things. They're a big box. And they take the back off, and I'm looking over his shoulder. And in there, you see these tubes glowing like this. And maybe there'll be one that's not glowing, or maybe weak, or something. And he had a tube tester, and he'd test them, and then he'd replace it, and he'd charge you. Well, I found out that the hardware store had a tube tester. 
So I made myself available to the community to, to, <laughs> to test, to fix their TVs. I'd go and I'd take the tubes out. I usually took all of them out. And I'd ride on my bike to the hardware store, I'd test the tubes, I'd find the weak one, I'd buy it, and I'd come back with an appropriate capitalistic markup. <clears throat> I would make a little profit. So yeah, tubes had problems. Now, there was a key problem in the United States that pushed the development for the replacement of tubes. Uh, I don't expect you to know this, but there was one key, not that they burned, not that they, you know, all the other limitations, one company had a problem, big problem, and that was AT&T. AT&T dominated long distance phone calls. And long distance phone calls required a boosting amplifier every 500 miles or so. So you made a call, Kyle calls me in California, in this day and age, that call would require a, a boost every 500 miles before it gets to me. So there'd be a building you would look at it and think it's a house, but it's, a, it's an amplification station. Call goes in, weak, comes out strong, goes to the next one. They used tubes for those. They worked fine, but they had to be replaced. They would burn out. They used too much power. And Bell Labs also wanted to have, I mean, uh, AT&T wanted to do under the sea calls from here to England or here to Spain, here to Madrid. So they're going to have cables under the ground. You can't have a cable without a uh, booster. It's too far to go without a booster. So they're going to have to have power and tubes under the water in, in casing. So they wanted a replacement. They owned Bell Labs. And they gave this request to Bell Labs. Anybody heard of Bell Labs? No? You have. It's, it's sometimes called the idea factory. If you're ever stumped for an answer, somebody says to you, let's say in the 1950s or 60s, 70s, who invented X, and you don't know? A good guess is Bell Labs. It really is, if, you, if you're lost for an answer, if you're on Jeopardy or something, um, this is Bell Labs. It, it's, its list of things that were discovered or invented there are huge. Another good guess is IBM, but Bell Labs is a, is a good guess as to what, what they, so they were called the Idea Factory. They were given the job of coming up with a solution to replace tubes. They wanted them rugged, small, Minimum power, not hot. That was the replacement goal. Low cost, long, long life. What was it? What did they invent that replaced tubes? Yeah. Transistor. The, easy because it's the title of the talk, right? <laughs> this, the transistor. This is the first transistor, 1947, 76 years ago, right? That's just the model. And that's what actually won the Nobel Prize, this, this, this invention. Uh, I won't go through how it works, but it basically is germanium, uh, an element here. And uh, it basically is, is uh, an, an a solid state, as you said, solid state device that can amplify. That's the basic transistor. Here are the people that discovered it, and they won the prize in 1956. Bardeen, Shockley, and Bertain. And here is what, it's really a very simple device. So with the vacuum tube, remember we had three elements. We had the cathode, the grid, and the anode. Here we have three layers, two different types of material. And that does the same thing. I'll explain that in a second. But they found very quickly that they needed to replace germanium. What did they replace it with? See the question marks, new type of material? What was the material that they replaced? What are transistors made from? Where do I live? California, yeah, but what part? Silicon. What is silicon? Second most common element in the Earth's crust. Crust, not interior. If the Earth, Earth was a really big apple, the crust, all the water, all the mountains, all the rocks, everything we know would fit into the skin of that apple. So most of the earth is not the crust. But in the crust, second most common element, what's the number one element? Anybody guess? Carbon. Carbon? That's a good guess. No, it's not it. It's oxygen. Almost all the rocks are oxides of some kind. So, um, oh, and by the way, it's not silicone. Silicone is 
the stuff for body implants. You know, you want fake muscles or fake some, you want some other fake thing, I don't know what you want. So don't say cone, there's no cone, it's silicon, all right? And it's in every rock. Pure silicone, quartz, opal, amethyst, but it's also in granite and sandstone. So if you melt silicon, you get glass. If you rip it apart and react it with carbon at high temperature, you get silicon. Crude, pure silicon. You've probably never seen it, now you will. So this, a lot of this stuff I left here, we put it in storage, which is a good idea. This is silicon, this is the element. Might be a little sharp, so don't try to cut yourself with it. SI, silicon. This is the basis for a, a gigantic portion of our economy and for almost everything that uses electricity. But that silicon that you're handling is not good because it's required to be so pure that just touching it would makes it unusable. So this is uh, just for passing around for, to show you. So now you've seen silicon. Now you know SOS, now you've made light bulbs, now you've seen silicon, okay? Um, silicon Valley. So the crude silicon is refined. It's refined to a ridiculous level of purity. You know, we think drugs are pure. We think, I don't know, biotech is pure. Nothing compared to this. 99.999999% pure. One atom of impurity is allowed for every, what is that? 100, 100,000, 100 million, billion silicon atoms. That's how pure it is. It's the purest thing we've ever used as, as, as a human race. Nothing comes close. I can't think of a thing that comes any, any closer to this. Now, review. We've got silica, right? Silica, I mean, silicon, that's the element you passed around. It's, a, it's number 14 on the periodic table. It's funny, my students are going to school in Silicon Valley and I say, who can tell me what silicon is? And, you know, you live here, right? Why Silicon Valley? Then there's silicon, silicon, silica, and silicone. So I think these are mixed up. Yeah. Silicon. That's the element. Silica is the mineral, and silicone is the stuff that you use to puff up a part of your body. Okay, moving on. Most important, one of the most important discoveries ever been made, is how to use this in semiconductors. Um, <clears throat> So transistors are semiconductor devices. You dope them, meaning you put purposely a little bit of impurity, little tiny bit, I mean little tiny bit, of boron or phosphorus, and you put the two together, it makes a junction. That's, the, that's all it is. It's actually pretty simple, I'll show you. Um, makes possible transistors, but it also makes possible solar cells. Light hits this stuff, it makes electricity. Turn around the other way. You put electricity on it and you get light, LEDs. So all of those are semiconductors. So remember our la vacuum tube where we had this anode and grid and cathode. That directly relates to the tra transistor, the emitter, base, and collector. Does the same thing. A little signal at the base modifies this big current flowing across it. That's it. And from that, you've got trillions of dollars worth of economies and, and jobs and devices and the internet and social media and software and hardware and everything virtually you touch. Okay, so like tubes, transistors can amplify and they can switch. You put a little signal into this red one here, this red part, red silicon, and it modifies the power flowing across it to get you amplification. For a switch, same thing, the computer puts in an input and it switches it instantaneously on and off. That's the whole secret of transistors. Now AT&T was happy. They could use these to build the amplifiers they needed to boost signals across the US and undersea. See that thing that's going underwater? Not only does it boost the signal, they gotta provide power to that. So it's either a battery, long but life battery, or there's gotta be a wire back to home plate 
send the electricity down under the sea. There are hundreds of these cables under the sea and thousands of them across the land. That's, those are transistors. They look small, right? They're not. Those are huge. Those are gigantic transistors. Those are transistors the size of the sun. Right? And you can see where they are in, I'll, I'll tell you why in a second, but um, see there, in, this is a circuit board, there's the transistors. It's as if they're using them like they're little tubes. And indeed, that's what they did. They were so unique that companies advertised the number of transistors in their products. I was too young to have one of these, but my older cousins, one had a six transistor radio, and then my cousin Alan got an eight transistor radio. He was top dog for a while. So they were really unique, and imagine counting the number of transistors and products today. It, it, it's ridiculous, I'll show you in a second. But they were very unique, they revolutionized the electronics industry. We got away from tubes. They hardly ever burn out, they're tiny, they use almost no power, so mobile products became enormous. A TV like this, would pro it, with vacuum tubes, would probably go back about this deep and weigh well, four or 500 pounds if it was that big. With, with, now you've got your cell phones, you've got your internet, you've got social media, you've got software, you've got hardware, all because of transistors. It enabled battery power, it enabled mobile, it enabled lightweight. Whole new markets were created, thousands, millions of jobs, right? Here's just that some early battery powered products. However, if we were dependent on transistors, we'd never have the cell phone in your pocket. Because they're individuals. As small as these things look, if I need a million of them, I've got a problem. And the breakthrough, the absolutely stunning breakthrough that happened was when Texas Instruments came out with the first integrated circuit in 1956. And what that is, is how do I put multiple transistors on the same piece of silicon and connect them? How do I do that? Uh, multiple transistors on the same chip. They won the Nobel Prize. Intel improved it. This is a, you see the dime, US currency, dime there. And then this is, the, this is a blow up of this. And that has four transistors. Big deal, but it was a big deal. Four transistors on the same chip. So now we have individual transistors. Now we're making them on wafers. We've got many chips on a wafer and many transistors on a chip. Now, I've been only partially successful in passing these things around. I tried gluing them to a piece of wood. This is an old size uh, silicon wafer. It's, of course, of no use because I touched it or I brought it out of the clean room where it's supposed to be. But if you, I want to pass these around. Be careful. They're, they're thin and they, they break even glued. Yeah, please. Uh, I got some more over here. And you can see one is already, one is already broken, so I'm not going to pass that one out. Um, now, you're, what you're looking at is a revolution in manufacturing and electronics. It's individual chips. So each little square you see is a chip. You'll get that one, okay? I'll take this. And there may be a hundred, there may be a thousand, there may be a million transistors on each chip. And on the wafer, there may be 10 or 20. The current technology, I didn't bring it because I only have one, and I didn't want to lose it in customs, is a 12-inch wafer. It's beautiful. It's like this big. And there are thousands of chips, and each chip has billions of transistors. So they take one of these chips, and they put it in a package, which is what you, if you've ever taken a circuit apart and you see a little black square that's a bunch of resin inside that is one of these fragile little chips um, and, you, and you get uh, an integrated circuit so we get integrated circuits which look like this pass a couple of these on that side and now we're talking about a circuit you get those here you go with the, uh, millions of transistors all encased in a uh, protective black uh, 
epoxy or resin that gets plugged into the circuit. And that usually does a sig single task, like your windshield wiper controller or your light dimmer or something. Beyond that, you get enough on there that you get a microprocessor, which you all have in your computer and in your cell phone. Now this is a whole computer brain, the whole thing. We talked about that ENIAC computer with 18,000 tubes. Like I said, it's nothing. This is an old chip with probably a billion transistors on it. I only have one of these. Um, and then this is a microchip that you might find in a cell phone. It's different size. You can make these any size you want. But this is a computer brain. The other I passed around is an integrated circuit dedicated to do something, a light dimmer, a speed controller, control your fan, something like that. The second the microprocessor, the CPU, is a whole computer on a single chip. Right? So if you look at that chip. It's got all these connectors. The chip is the part that the silicon is the part in the middle. And all the rest is how do you connect it to the real world, which is a, a state-of-the-art issue. So the features are so small, you can't touch, you can't manufacture by any common means. They had to create new technology, photolithography, chemical etching, ion implantation. Actually, there's a list of about 100 different techniques to create these chips. And the purity levels are so critical that a factory, a semiconductor factory, costs about $40 billion. So you, it's not a startup anymore. And the factories are so clean, million times cleaner than any hospital if you've ever been in the hospital. Special things, people have to wear spacesuits. And the, the, chip, the wafers hardly ever come out. They're all in robotic boxes that move around even though it's so clean in there. It's so clean in there, you, you know, in 100 years, you'd have no dust. It, it, it's just in, incredible. And you, you no longer can take a tour. You used to be able to get a tour. Now it's real hard. You gotta know somebody. So the way they do it, you say, well, how do they create these little tiny lines if you can't even see them? It's photolithography is, you know how you look in the wrong end of a telescope and everything looks real small? So they create, the, they create the circuit on a big board like this, or bigger. And then they use lenses to shrink and shrink and shrink so you can work with light and shrink down the image. And then it gets printed onto that wafer that we're passing around. So at some point, some engineering team has designed the circuit, which you can see. Maybe the circuit's as big as this room. But then through light, they break up pieces of it, and they shrink it down like looking in the wrong end of the telescope. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can no longer see the lines, but they can still print them. And that's called photolithography. And that's the way they invented, I mean, they manufactured. So a little, there, there are some examples of the steps. It's thousands of steps, hundreds of steps, over and over again. I simplified it, because I think I'd like to tell you how to make a transistor. So you take a piece of silicon, raw silicon, the flat wafer, N. It's been doped with the material that makes it called N. Phosphorus is what they use. Remember we talked about silica, the glass. Well, you hit that with some oxygen, and this part of this SI becomes SiO2. Then you coat it with a photoresist. It's like a negative in a camera. And then you present the image, tiny little line, and that changes this photoresist to where it'll be washed away in the next step. The rest of it stays, this will go away. So now we've washed away the piece that we've exposed. We then take an acid and we etch through the orange silica, the glass, the insulator. And now we deposit through vapor deposition a second type of silicon. We're going to put in a p-type there. And then we do it again. And we end up with a sandwich, right? Like a dessert. We've got one, two, three. We've got three layers, two of one kind and one of another. And then we use another technique to create tiny little wires that connect the three. So now we've got one, two, three. All transistors have three connections. You see us 
See a little thing with three wires? It's probably a transistor. Now that's a super simplified version of how they make them. You do that billions of times. You do that with features you can't see. That's how revolutionary this is. This is ancient history. This is the 8086 chip. It looks complicated, but it's only got 50,000 transistors. This was the backbone of the PC revolution, the 8086. This was the chip that made everybody be able to make uh, PC type clones. It's what was the, Apple used a slightly different chip that looked just like this. And that's, that's and on the bottom is the way it was, it looked on the circuit board. So that was, you know, four micron features, four microns, 50,000 transistors, and already looks too complicated to connect. Well, we talk microns. You use microns here? Everybody know microns? I didn't. Uh, and now we're at nanometers. I, don't, I didn't know what that was either, so I'm going to show you what that is. So micron, millionth of a meter. A human hair is about 80 microns. Cross section, not length. The diameter, right? And you can't see one micron. So that when it gets, nanometer is a ridiculously small thing. You know, a germ's about 1,000 nanometers. DNA is about two nanometers wide. And a na one nanometer is like if you took 10 hydrogen atoms and laid them next to each other and then measured it, you get one nanometer. Okay, well, here's what we've done in semiconductors. I mentioned the four micron chip, the middle there, but we're now down to nanometers, which are now struggling with the size of the image that we're presenting because it's so, so small. Imagine features that are the size of DNA. So, how big is a nanometer? Let's make the almost inconceivable nano world conceivable. The naked eye can see the diameter of a human hair. That's one tenth of a millimeter, or 100,000 nanometers. To understand the small, we're going to scale it up to skyscraper proportions and return to our human hair and blow it up to the size of the Empire State Building. A typical human cell, say a red blood cell, would rise to the 10th floor. A bacteria cell, the third floor. Working down our scale, a run-of-the-mill protein molecule would be the same height as a small dog, about a foot and a half and a nanometer, on our Empire State scale, it's less than a quarter of an inch. That's about the size of five microscopic atoms placed end to end. It's numbers like this that I can't, maybe some of you can, but it's like when we talked about the speed of light, when we talked about, you know, it's like it's beyond human uh, consciousness in some ways. It's beyond what we experience every day. So we use video like that to try to give you some idea of how incredible we're down to. So as I said, today's wafers are now up, not like the ones I passed around, uh, about this big. And um, IBM announced not too long ago a new chip. Now the chip is the thing in red, but the wafer is 12 inches. A new chip with 50 billion transistors. 50 billion transistors inside that red box. And the, each transistor is about the size of two DNA strands, which is just, now we're probably at the end of just shrinking it. But you know, there'll be other technologies that'll come save us. But that's, 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 this, this isn't on the market yet, but it is, in, in most of you, anybody, where's my friend, did she leave? Uh, she, uh, the, uh, iPhone 14 has got about eight billion, no, 16 billion transistors. More than twice as many as uh, all the people in the world. Okay, so that's the IBM model. Um, one of the things, when I passed around those wafers for you, with you, you probably thought of them as flat, like they were printed. Like, like you're looking at a two-dimensional image. Nope, this is a three-dimensional structure. But of course, since it's the size of bacteria, you can't see or feel. You put your finger across that, there's nothing, you know? 
Well, that's because of the, uh, uh, the features are so small. But they have to, all those transistors have to be connected. You know, you've got to, they're down here. And if you ever thought of a big crowd, think of the biggest crowd you were ever at. I have a picture of the Metallica concert in Moscow, and there's a million people. And you wanted to connect some of them with others, but not cross the wires. How would you do it? Well, now you've got billions of transistors, and you want to connect some of them with this, some of them with that, but you don't want the wires to touch on the connection. The only way to solve that is to go up. And so what you're looking at is an electron microscope of the first few layers of the connectors, which are also a challenge to make. The transistors are down here. And yet, when you look at this, and this is ancient, this is old stuff, and you run your finger there, there's, no, there's no, nothing to feel. It's because they're the size of bacteria. Um, Moore's Law. Who knows Moore's Law? Yeah. Your name, please? Alvo. What's Moore's Law? Hey, I'll tell you, you got students here that know. Who else knew that? You knew it, too. Okay, so Moore's Law, who, uh, and that's who it's named for, Gordon Moore. Very good. Okay. Moore's Law. Moore's Law is what's made possible everything you use and uh, it has, that uses electricity, everything. Um, number of transistors, I'm just going to use the doubling, not the cost. Uh, we'll double every two years. It's not a natural law, and I love this because it's UFM. It's a measure of human ingenuity. It's not like thermodynamics or gravity. If we all disappeared, gravity wouldn't care. It's still a law. It works exactly the same whether we're here or not. This isn't a law like that. This is a law of human ingenuity. People will figure out, that's what Gordon Moore said. He, he didn't say it that way, but people will figure out how to double the number of transistors on a chip every two years. And by the way, sometimes people say, well, how big a chip did he mean? Doesn't matter if it's a chip this big or that big or whatever, it'll double on that size chip every two years. Human in Will we, did he know how that would happen? No, he just knew people would figure it out. And it's been absolutely true for a long time. Now this is exponential growth, doubling. You all take, who takes statistics? Who, who's taken anything with exponentials in it? Yeah, 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 okay. All right, so here's, you know when we deal with exponentials, we have to use a log scale because it goes off the paper so fast. But a log scale never looks very impressive to me. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not a human kind of thing, right? It's a scientific thing. I know what it is, but this is what it really is. It's, it's every time it gets bigger and bigger, faster and faster. Einstein said it was the most powerful force in the universe. We're gonna do a little demo now. I want your honor that you won't participate if you've seen this, okay? Everybody, um, don't, don't participate. In fact, let's make it interesting. How about, I don't know, 20 bucks? 40? 40 bucks. Okay. So, if you could fold a piece of paper 42 times, you can't, but you can double a piece of paper 42 times. You get, the fold gets too big. If you could fold it 42 times, how thick would it be? If you know the answer, don't participate. I only lost this once and a student cheated. I was not um, And I want it in, 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 in a number, not scientific notation, not from here to Antigua, uh, a number like a mile, a foot, a kilometer, whatever, whatever you want, but a number, okay? So, um, now, I'll give you a hint. So we're talking 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, right? Uh, 128, 256, 512. You recognize those numbers? It's like when you buy an SD card or, 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 or uh, some storage device. It's those kind of numbers. Why? Because that's, that's what it is. So we're now, okay, so let me do that again. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. At 9, we're at 512. Well, a ream of paper happens to be 500. Right, so we're gonna fold a piece of paper, ream of paper is 500. So there's nine folds, and we can double it. So here's 10. So now I can't fold it, but I sure as hell can double it. So here's 10. Now what do we got there, about, uh, I don't know, four inches, five inches? Um, 
whatever the centimeter equivalent is that, right? Okay, now we at 10 folds, we're this high. At 20 folds, we're going to, I mean, at 11, we're going to be this high. Where are we at 42? Who's going to play? No, no downside on your part. Come on, give me a number. Who's, who's got an idea? Guess. If you don't know, it's okay. I'm not going to make fun of you. How, 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 42 fold. This is 10. 11 is going to be here. 12 is going to be there. Okay? What did I say? Did I say a number? Did I say not to participate if you knew the answer? Did I say don't give me a distance from here to Antigua? All right, all right. Okay. All right, well, now we'll know. Okay, so uh, this is Moore's Law. There's always one. Um, so here's our doubling, right? Now we're up to four inches. Now this is so unbelievable that I had to calculate all the numbers. You can win bar bets or you just leave this guy out of it. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's okay. Sorry. I, you, you're so enthusiastic you couldn't hold it. So I had to pull all the numbers. So here's 10, right? At 20, we're at a million sheets of paper. Not, not any distance yet. Million sheets. At 30, we're at a billion sheets. So we've done 30 doublings. At 40 doublings, we're at a trillion sheets. How big's a trillion? Spend a million dollars every hour for 24 hours. Takes 411 years to spend a trillion. So we stay up all night. You'd be good at this, Susan. You spend a, spend a million dollars every hour for 24 hours. It takes 411 years. A million seconds, 11 days. A billion seconds, 32 years. A trillion seconds. A trillion seconds was before history. So these, these doublings are absolutely staggering to me. I can't, you know, get it up here. A trillion seconds, 30 years. And I come from a country that's $31 million, trillion dollars in debt. No matter how much we raise, doesn't matter. We just spend more. So that's a trillion. All right, we're at a trillion at 40. At 42, we're at 4.4 trillion. So now we know we've got 4.4 trillion sheets. Now all we have to do is multiply by how thick a sheet is, and we got our answer. So here's our 4.4 trillion piece of paper, a copy paper like that's about a tenth of a millimeter. So we do the math. We get 440 kilometers, about 270 miles, or about the average distance to the moon. And the only person who got it right cheated. So, uh, so this, is, this is safe. Next time. So, um, but no, that's the power of exponential. And that's what's been going on in transistors for since 1970. Uh, absolute incredible thing. Now, without transistors, there's products that would not be possible. I don't mean products that would be better, I mean, could not exist. You could not have computers, cell phones, World Wide Web, uh, uh, Windows, uh, software, social media. None of that could happen without transistors, integrated circuits. There's other products where they were, uh, or, or here, a cell phone. This is a model, I wish it was real, of the first cell phone, right? Uh, Motorola, Marty Cooper, I knew him, but he's passed away. Uh, no screen, no text, no buttons, no, no, you could talk for 30 minutes, that's it, right? Natalia, what time am I on? Can you get me a lapel mic? Yeah, okay. Um, eight hours to recharge it, only voice calls. Oh, weighed a couple pounds. How much would you pay for this? Well, how much did they pay for it? It was a status symbol. Cost $4,000 in 1984. And I always tell my students, you know, whenever you see a number with a date, you've got to put it into today's dollars. Inflation is, you know. So you do that, you do the inflation price converter, it's $11,000. So clearly this is like a status symbol. It's like a Bucati or a Ferrari or Rolex. You know, you don't, the rest of us don't buy them. 
That's what this was. But you wouldn't have any cell phones without transistors. This thing only had 200,000. What, what's my uh, moon guy's, what's your name? I couldn't get that. Uh, what cell phone do you have? Uh, 11. 11. So you've got about 8 billion transistors. This had 200,000. Um, new iPhones got 16 billion, more than all the people on the earth. Twice as much. And I don't know where this is going, but it's got real implications on society. We've now put them into everything. Things that worked fine without them now have them. In fact, can you think of anything that uses electricity that doesn't have a transistor? You may not know it, but this controller, my goodness, this is a wireless radio. This is a, uh, a, a little computer, right? Every, but, but light switches. The, the drill, the power tools, the cars. We had a big shortage of cars this year. Why? They couldn't get chips. It used to be you had a shortage of cars because you couldn't get tires. It was a problem with rubber or, or something. So everything now has uh, a chip in it. Um, you know, everything's dependent on, electric, on, on, on uh, chips. And the only thing I can think of common that doesn't use a chip is an old fashioned, if you have one in your house that's an incandescent light bulb without a dimmer, just a switch. There's no transistor in that. But I can't think of too many other things, excuse me. Okay, so this was an ad in 1985. And the ad said, thanks to Moore's Law, all this fits in your smartphone. I mean, it was an ad today. But back then, that was an ad. Guy showing all the things that you could get. This was Radio Shack. Well, that ad is so deceiving because the stuff he's holding can't do a tenth, a hundredth, a thousandth of what we have. I mean, yeah, he's got a, uh, a basic computer down here, but that computer's got five lines of LCD. It doesn't have a screen. It, you know, it can't do anything compared to what you buy. So, yeah, all of it fits in your pocket, costs less, weighs less, uses a tiny fraction of power, but in addition, all the stuff we have today does a billion times more. Um, if miles per gallon in your car followed Moore's law, your car would come with a tank of gas sealed. Never have to put electric, uh, uh, gas in it. It would last hundreds of years if miles per gallon was the same thing as Moore's law. Computer speed. This is what I'll, I'll kind of end with. Um, remember that ENIAC I showed you with 18,000 vacuum tubes? The 5,000 calculations a second. Sounds like a lot. In three years, it did more calculations than all the people in the world had ever done before. It was just an incredible step. Well, the IBM mainframe, a million. The iPhone 6, the 6. Anybody still got a 6? The iPhone 6. <laughs> the iPhone 6 is more powerful by 100 times than the computer that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon. So it does 25 billion calculations. A not modern I mean, a gamer, any gaming PC people here? You know, fancy games? So now you're up to a trillions of calculations. And the fastest computer last year was the Fujitsu that did 442 quintillion, quadrillion, excuse me, quadrillion. Now it's another thing that I can't relate to and I imagine you can't either. So I've got a little demo of what that means. But the implication of this for the future is big. Um, Here's a billion pennies, five stacks, size of a school bus. Okay, I can relate to that, billion. Here's a trillion pennies, so there's our little guy standing down here next to the school bus, and that's a, a trillion pennies, pretty big. Here's a trillion pennies next to, anybody been to the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building in New York? You've seen pictures of the Empire State Building. Well, there's a trillion pennies, okay? Here's a quadrillion pennies. There's our, our trillion was down here, right? Now we're up to a quadrillion. Three billion tons of pennies, a half mile wide. And here's our computer. It's doing 442 calculations that size in a second, in a second. And it's not gonna stop. That's just last year, right? So. We're now approaching the size of atoms. You can't just make them smaller. You, you can't, you can't 
go any smaller than Adam. Um, but there's new technologies coming. When you're my age, I can't even imagine where this is going. I mean, you've got 3D architecture, quantum computers, different materials, all kinds of things are coming down the pike. And the question is, what might it mean for the future? This enormous power and running on batteries, uh, doing calculations that we can't even conceive of, you know? What, what might it mean for smart products and medical procedures? I mean, sometimes now you go to a doctor and the doctor may have studied 100,000 cases, 1,000 cases, 10,000 cases. Armed with artificial intelligence, the doctor could look at an infinite number. Could, could look at all the cases they have records for and help the doctor tell you what, what to do, right? Self-driving cars, Internet of Things, robotics. Self-driving cars, someday your kids or you when you're older are going to think, let me see. People like Art and Coyote, or you too, you're drivers. Who drives here? Everybody? Right. You're driving down the road at 100 feet per second. With what? Your eyes and your hands? And your feet? That's it? 100 feet a second? Self-driving cars. I mean, I like to drive, so I don't really want a self-driving car, but it's going to save. In the United States, we lose about 40,000 people a year in car crashes. It's going to save energy. It's going to save accidents. It's going to do Plus, older people will now be able to get in their car and tell them where they want to go, and the car will take them there. So it's got big social impact. Um, robotics, AI, we're all worried about AI, right? I mean, 442 quadrillion calculations. I mean, someday the machine may wake up. There's a science fiction story called uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, where the machine becomes satient. Uh, what's that going to do to us? Um, pluses and minuses, right? Privacy, all kinds of issues, which some of them, many of them you study.